Anyhow, uh, I'm pleased today uh, to uh, introduce via Zoom uh, our speaker, Mary Maziotti Gillen, who's Professor Emeritus from Binghamton University. Uh, mostly she's connected with Newark and she runs a, 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 a literature office in Newark and that is uh, brought new life to uh, the Northern New Jersey. She's not just an Italian poet, an Italian American poet. Uh, she is a poet of great note and uh, she has been teaching literature and poetry writing uh, for many years. And uh, now, of course, uh, uh, she's in pensione, but she's still uh, very active. Uh, she did a great Zoom for us uh, in a, a series. And if you ever get an email from me, you've got a link to the uh, Zoom series of about 30 different uh, interviews with uh, uh, Italian-American writers and scholars. So, uh, uh, Maria focuses on family relations and um, uh, the uh, joys of growing up in the 40s and 50s and sometimes the not so joyous parts of the 40s and 50s, uh, the uh, life in the, the Italian American community in New Jersey. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today, and I want to thank uh, Dominic Candelaro and Anne Weiss uh, for putting this all together, plus all the staff at Casa Italia in Chicago. Um, when I first was invited to do this, I was trying to think, well, what can I talk about? And I realized that I had to go back to the way I was educated. Um, as a girl, and when Italian American writers were never mentioned, if there were any, I, I didn't know about them in the 40s and 50s. Um, and so the people I was introduced to as writers were all uh, people that were uh, of much more solidly American backgrounds. Uh, for me, school was in English and my house was in Italy and school was America. Uh, the people we were taught to read were people like Edgar Allan Poe or Henry Wadsworth Longfellow or John Greenleaf Whittier, many of whom have really fallen out of favor now, but those were the poets that we were introduced to when I was a child. And I fell in love with the way English sounded. I always loved the way Italian sounds and the softness of it, but then, there's another kind of music in English that I fell in love with when I heard these writers and their works read aloud. Um, no one mentioned uh, Italian American writers or um, especially women writers uh, and not only American, not only Italian American, but American women writers, except for Emily Dickinson. Um, but I was enamored by the sound of English and I tried to write myself at a very early age. Uh, my first po poem was a poem about a dog wagging his tail. I didn't have a dog. My mother miss, was Mrs. Clean and she wanted a dog in the house. So I was not um, familiar with dogs and yet I wrote this stupid poem about the dog. And by the time I wrote it when I was nine, by the time it actually appeared in St. Anthony's Messenger, <clears throat> I was 13. And I was already at Eastside High School studying with wonderful teachers who really enhanced my love of literature, Alfred Weiss and Francis Durbin, who was also Allen Ginsberg's uh, teacher. And so I, in with these people, I learned to love the poets like E. Cummings and Amy Lowell and Eleanor Wiley and Edna St. Vincent Millay and the stories of Nathaniel Hawthorne and George Eliot and Thomas Hardy. You notice none of them are Italians. Um, no one mentioned Italian American writers, uh, not even Dante, I don't think. Um, 
the only time they ever mentioned was Columbus. And the poor man has fallen into disrepute. Um, so in uh, college, uh, although I took tons of English courses because I got a scholarship and I could take as many English classes as I wanted, uh, there was not a single Italian American writer who was spoken of in my class. And the same thing happened in my graduate classes in literature. I have to say that my understanding of Italian American literature began building once I met Helen Barolini, who wrote, who edited the Dream Book. And uh, actually, a couple of years before that, in 1980, my first book was published, and a graduate school professor said to me, You know, it's in this poem about your father that you find the story you really have to tell. And up until then, I was trying to write like English romantic poets I was reading, or like T.S. Eliot, or uh, all the, the people I was reading in English and American literature. And I was trying to pretend that I was upper class American. He made me realize that I could write about being Italian American. I could write about being lower class. I could write about not speaking, speaking English when I went to school. I could write about my own background, about being a wife, a mother, and that I could use details of my own life to write. I didn't have to stick Greek gods in, which are in my first book and is very embarrassing. Um, but a, we all have to find our way. And that was my way of finding my way. Uh, when Helen Barolini, I, I started the Poetry Center in Patterson uh, previous to 1980, actually. but. <clears throat> The first grant I got for the Poetry Center was in 1980. And a few years later, I invited Helen Barolini to come and talk about the anthology she was putting together called The Dream Book, Writing by Italian American Women. And I got the nerve, I never read in my own readings, but I got the nerve to stand up and read a poem of mine, Public School Number 18. And Patterson, New Jersey. And she uh, said immediately she wanted to publish that poem in the anthology. And then she took another poem as well. Those were the first poems that really dealt with my ethnicity and in an honest and real way. And I, I was very encouraged by the fact that the New York Times Book Review chose to end the review of Barolini's book with 14 lines of my poem. It was very exciting, I have to say. And until then, I was kind of tentatively steady, stepping outside the house into America and into the American literary community. Um, it's also in that book that I encountered Rachel Guido de Vries and her wonderful novel, Tender Warriors. And it was through that book that I became aware of Barolini's Albert, Albertina, which was a wonderful groundbreaking Italian American novel. It was my first glimpse of these other writers. And so it felt like instead of being totally on the outside all the time, I was meeting kindred spirits. Then Anthony Julian Chin Buri and Fred Gardafay and Paolo Giordani <laughs> Giordano published um, From the Margins, uh, a, an anthology of Italian American literature and criticism. And it was a wonderful uh, compilation for me of people whose work I hadn't encountered before. So it opened up a world for me that made me feel that I was seen for the first time. And it's something that I try, try to do in my own life all the way through my life from that point on. Uh, I think we, we are all as Italian writers, Italian American writers at that point, living in a little box all by ourselves and listening to our own echoes. So what these, what Anthony and Fred and Paolo did was to make a space for all of us and to make us see ourselves in the mirror of American literature where we had been missing in action completely. Uh, the wonderful thing for me was to have a reading at the Poetry Center uh, from that book and meeting all those writers in person 
who came to that reading and, and, uh, and what resulted from that meeting was a meeting in New York City in the next month of uh, an organization called uh, the Italian American Writers Association, uh, founded by Bob Viscusi and a bunch of other writers, where we fought a lot during that first meeting and somebody objected to being taped and it was very paranoid. They were afraid people were going to find out they were Italian American. I don't know how they expected to hide that. Uh, but anyway, um, Bob Viscusi came up with the idea of we have to tell our own stories or other people will tell them for us. And I thought that was a very important thing. And he really emphasized through the Italian American Writers Association and got us all to go out and do the same thing to push other writers not only to push our own work, but to push the work of other writers who were trying to talk about their Italian American experience. And of course, all the Italian American experiences are different, but in a way it's a way for us to show the rest of the world what it was like to grow up in America as an Italian American and the kind of prejudice that existed. And I, you know, I think my mother, was very hot on Stazi, so don't call attention to yourself, be quiet. And I think many times were raised that way. Uh, so in a way we've been left out of any list of people who endured prejudice in the United States, but the Italians were as much discriminated against as any other ethnic, ethnic group. And we, um, we just didn't want to admit it, I think even to ourselves. Anyway, by, by these people starting to say, read, read Italian Americans, buy their books, uh, provide space for them to be published. So a whole bunch of magazines were created, Voices in Italian Americana, Italian Americana. Uh, my magazine, Patterson Literary Review, has always published a lot of Italian Americans and I publish reviews and stories as well. Uh, and the Poetry Center always features Italian American writers and has conferences on Italian American writers. So in the Calandra Institute uh, with Anthony Tamburi uh, has done a great deal to make a space where Italian American writers can be heard. Um, Kazi Tatiana as NYU has done the same thing. I think the more that we can create space for other writers, because I think we as writers can be very self-centered. So the more we can create space for other Italian writers, the more power we gain in shaping the American literary canon and in forcing people to include us. And I have to say, my daughter and I did three major anthologies for Viking Penguin, Unsettling America, Identity Lessons, and Growing Up Ethnic in America. And we got a lot of flack for including Italian Americans. People actually called up and yelled at me. Uh, why did you include Italian Americans? Um, they're, they're prejudiced, they're gangsters. I mean, I got everything, but I just kept going. It didn't matter. I don't care what they said. And because I felt that we as Italians, um, Italian Americans had to claim our space in America and had, made, had to make people see us. Um, I think that many people have been very act active in this movement to try to have a place for Italian Americans to be published. So Anthony Timbori started Bordigara Press and Voices in Italian Americana uh, and, and Fred Gardefe and um, uh, Antonio D'Alfonso started Guernica Editions in Canada and he started publishing not only Canadian writers but Italian American writers as well. Every time the circle is opened by and widened by having another place to be published, another place to get our books out there. Uh, there's a bookstore in um, Boston called Italian American, I Am Books, Italian American Books. They've gone on hiatus now because of the pandemic, but they're coming back as a store and they're available online. I think we should try to support these people and support all they do to try to bring attention to Italian American writers. I have to also give a salute to writers and editors like Mary Jo Bona 
and um, Daniela Giuseppe and Edwige Junta for uh, the anthologies they've done and the writing they've done on Italian American writers. And I have to also is express my gratitude for Elisabetta Marino in Rome at the University of Rome, Tor Vigano, Tor Vigata, and um, Carla Franciolini, who is also at the University of Siena, and Margarita uh, Ganieri, who is at the University of Calabria, for all they've done to try to encourage international cooperation between um, Italians in the Italian diaspora. And I think there's, um, Margarita has a program at the University of Calabria and um, Sabrina Vellucci and Anthony Tamburi have a program at the University of Rome Tre. And they're trying to do programs and print essays about the Italian diaspora. I think if we're going to get anywhere as uh, writers, we really need the support that uh, a friend of mine used to say, I wish I'd gone to Harvard because um, they have such a way of helping one another. Well, we as Italian Americans have to learn to help one another and not be angry when somebody gets a spotlight on them. Instead, try to reach out and help them. I think the other thing that was started, I think, by Anthony Tambori and Fred was uh, to try to push for chairs in Italian American literature. So now we have two chairs at Queens College, CUNY. We have a chair at uh, SUNY Stony Brook, a uh, chair at Loyola University. And those are the ones that I know about. I'm sure there are more and maybe more in the offing. But those chairs enable us to be taught in Italian American and American literature courses. I think we have to do that if we're going to get anywhere as writers. We can't just sit in our studies and write and expect people to find us. I always tell my graduate students, it's up to you to make people know your work. It's up to you to get out there and read your work and send your work out and get it published in magazines and in books because nobody's going to come knocking at your door. Nobody's going to say, oh, I have to uh, publish you. No, they don't do that. So you have to get yourself out there. And what I think is wonderful about programs like today is it puts a spotlight on Italian American literature and on Italian American writing that we really desperately need. And we really need to help each other. I, I, I can't stress that enough. I really think we need to help each other. And now because I'm Pope, I'm going to finish with a poem. I think I'm not over my time, I hope not. <clears throat> and it's called Claiming My True Name. And it's from my latest book, When the Stars Were Still Visible. It took me years to claim my true name. So many years layered in shame. So many years trying to hide my immigrant self and my true name. Looking back, I know what I wanted when I saw you love that first time at your friend's house. You with your blonde boyish looks, your handsome face, your wide gray eyes your big white colonial house, your educated American parents. Did I imagine that by marrying you, I could erase all those Z's and T's in my name, change it all like an old coat I could give away and put on instead what I thought was a sleek Americanness of your name. And I was able to erase my ethnic face, my frizzy hair. How I wanted to deny the foreign girl I was the one who didn't speak English when I went to school, deny my Italian parents and the cold water flat, leave them all behind and slide right into the life of America that I was sure I wanted. Years later, I realized I had traded away everything that shaped me, traded away this song that beat in my blood, the aroma of ethnic food I loved. And only then staring into a void as big as the Grand Canyon did I claim my true name wrap all those Z's and T's around me and force people to use my true name, even when they stumbled over it and they'd have to ask, is this the way you pronounce your name? And I'd pronounce it for them, waving it in the air like a banner, proud of my Italian self, proud of all the things that mark me as unique, as different, a foreign creature who can at last claim 
my own true name. And that's it, the end of my speech. Uh, Maria will be monitoring uh, our proceedings here and she'll come back uh, in an hour or two and uh, make some comments on the presentations that have been done. And uh, I think she did a wonderful job of summarizing the, our reason for being here today and uh, our reason for uh, wanting to uh, save our stories. And uh, no, there's no better ambassador for that idea that I know. <laughs>